Welcome to Waterways and welcome to Aurelia and Lake Country. Aurelia sits on Lake Kuchiching, right above the narrows of Lake Simcoe, which unto itself is a fascinating part of geography because you have these two lakes that go through a very narrow stretch, hence the name. In fact, the swing bridge that used to be there is permanently open, and it really highlights just how small that stretch is. And if you're on the Trent Severn Waterway, you go through there, and that is a very narrow spot. Of course, if you're on the Trent Severn Waterway, you go through many locks. And if you start in Trenton on the Lake Ontario side, you got a few dozen to get through. But if you start in Georgian Bay, you only have four locks to go through until you get to Aurelia. And I would argue it's the most interesting collection of the locks of any four in a row that you're gonna get anywhere on the system or probably anywhere in North America. And I've done a lot of lockages. In fact, Parks Canada tells me that this stretch here between Georgian Bay and Lake Simcoe is the second busiest stretch of canal boating anywhere in North America. And upwards of 7,000 boats every year will come through here, including this behind me. But before we get to this one, you gotta start at Port Severn. That's the first lock if you come in from Georgian Bay, the final one if you're going the other way. It's the smallest lock anywhere on the Trent Severn system. It was built during World War I uh, as a small temporary lock, and they'd come back and fix it and expand it later on. Well. We're still waiting on that expansion, and right now it's the smallest on the system. It's also the busiest lock that's manually operated anywhere on the system. They still do everything by hand there at Port Severn. Once you get through that, you come here. This is Big Chute Marine Railway. It looks unlike anything you've probably seen because it is unlike just about anything in the world. It's the only one of its kind in North America, and one of only a handful anywhere in the world. Now, this is in place of a traditional lock. It uses rails to lift your boat up and over. Now, again, we can thank or blame World War I for this one because they didn't have the supplies and materials at the time, so they put in a temporarily used railway. But then, fast forward to the 60s and 70s, the sea lamprey, an invasive species, was coming in, and they had marine biologists studying the boats. And as they were using the marine railway, they found the lampreys couldn't hang on to the boats. So they decided, well, actually, maybe this is a good idea to keep a buffer between the waterways. So in 1978, this one opened, and it's still used today. So popular, in fact, that they have viewing platforms here for people to come look at. Past this one, interesting lock number three is Swift Rapids. That's the deepest lock on the entire system, hydraulically operated, and you're right out in the wilderness. So it's, it's very unique and fascinating because you either are dropping way down or raising way up and surrounded by all the beautiful trees of uh, Aurelia and Lake Country. And then to get into Lake Kuchiching, you go through Lock 42. Kuchiching Lock. Now, interestingly, that one was the final lock built anywhere on the Trent Severn Waterway system, which of course means it was the final linkage to make this 386 kilometer long waterway a single one. And it took 87 years for that final lock to be built from the first one. So took a little while, but I think it's worth the wait. And of course, you go through all those locks to get to Aurelia, and a port of Aurelia party is the kind of place you might want to be. And if you're there, watch out, there could be pirates. There's a lot of stops along the Trent Severn Waterway, but one of my favorite and one that's really popular, especially with loopers or anyone uh, traveling around, is Aurelia because they've got this massive and beautiful transient marina. And what a lot of people don't know is the history of this region. 
and there was piracy and gangs in the 1800s. You might not know that I also was a journalist before this boating world, so I have dusted off my journalism hat. I've embedded myself with a pirate gang, and I'm gonna see what's going on. What's going on up here? What are we doing? Okay, we're doing something with this big triangle flag. They tell me it's called a sail. And I see weapons aboard. And I have the Pirate King here. Where are we going? What are we doing? We are headed to Leacock Manor to attack the governor and take all the spoils. My goodness, you heard it here first, folks. We are going to attack the government. It could be it. We've been hearing about this. There might be hot tubs involved. I don't know. Okay, we're a few minutes from the attack point. As we're getting close, I'm here with Captain Slash McNash. Uh, tell me about this boat. Well, it's a whale boat. We've, uh, we've uh, absconded with these whale boats because they're great boats on the water, great sailors, etc. So we've, we've uh, mixed them up a little bit, to added some uh, extra rigs so we can go that much further and carry more people and more guns. And is this what pirates would have used? This is what the Navy's using? What, is this what you're seeing out on the seas, Captain? Most pirates, most pirates indeed would have used boats of about this size or maybe a little bit bigger. Only the very, very wealthy ones did well to get big ships. Okay, we're legit. We're closing in. I'm torn, I'm conflicted. I want to warn Governor Leacock, and yet, I want the shot. We gotta do it for the gram, Cappy. Fire it well. He's in there somewhere. Shots have been fired. It is underway. The ducks are terrified. The citizenry does not seem flustered. And the most important thing as a journalist is to maintain my integrity. I will let you know right now, I cannot be bought off. I will not fall into their traps, no matter what the spoils. Would this change anything? Yeah, 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 this is good. <laughs> if you switch sides, you've got to go all in. In case you couldn't sift through the subtlety of that edit, this is a good time. Even if the justice system here is woefully biased against those who identify as pirates. The highlight of the event is the grand showdown between the British and the pirates attempting to overtake Kuchiching Beach Park, complete with cannons. All 220 slips are sold out. There's even a wait list for this party, so it's best to plan a year ahead. And you never know who you're gonna run into. And ran into the CEO of the Boating Ontario Association, Rick Lazell, how are you? Buddy, great to see you. So, um, you know, this is a lot of fun. Obviously, you're into it as well, but I want you to put on your Boating Ontario Association hat. Yep. And let's talk about the tourism aspect, because this isn't just fun and flags. Like, there are benefits to the region for things like this, right? Well, absolutely. You've taken a marina with a couple of hundred slips, completely filled it with a wait list, and there's a direct economic impact for all of the, the shops and the restaurants downtown. We walked into a little surf shop this morning, Kahuna, Kahuna Surf Shop, and the manager's going, 
There's been pirates here all day. How cool is that, right? That this little event creates a direct spin-off for the local stores. A bunch of our friends here at the arena were in town last night at the restaurant. I might have wanted, went into town last night and had a beer. There's so much impact, though, that a full marina creates for the downtown core. And talk about the location a little bit. So people in this part of Ontario know about it, but this is on the Trans Severn Waterway. Uh, loopers love this spot because you've got these beautiful docks. It's transient only. Tell me about you know, Lake Cooch, Lake Simcoe, and why this is a great boating spot. Well, you're, you're as you said, Steve, you're a direct line on the Trans Severn Waterway, right? There's four more locks above us before you hit Georgian Bay. So as you're running up through here, this is a great stop to replenish and refurbish the boat. If you need groceries, if you need a uh, pharmacy, if you need restaurant, whatever you need, it's right here in the downtown core. And this transient slip, 200, 200 slip arena, absolutely services that. What a great boom for the downtown businesses, right? To have a 200 plus slip marina that's jam-packed on Labor Day weekend. Absolutely awesome. Now level with me. Did you know this was happening? Because this is how you dress on weekends, I think. Well, generally on Sundays only, Steve. But uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Absolutely, pal. Okay, now I need you to tell me about your shirt here. Let's yeah. see if we can get... So, uh, first of all, how do you say this word? Oh, wickwadozing. And what does that mean? Uh, or wickwadozing, I, hopefully I said that. That means uh, Little Bay in Ojibwe. The Port of Aurelia is on the west side of Lake Kuchiching, right in downtown Aurelia. But on the east side, you find yourself here, Ojibwe Bay Marina. And if you're here, you're going to find the marina manager, Steve Sanderson. How are you, buddy? Uh, good, thank you. OK, so. Beautiful location. I like the flowers. Tell me a bit Fall about mums, the yeah. Fall mums. Fall mums. It's important. Uh, it's a 150-slip uh, uh, marina layout uh, with a mix of uh, covered and open slips in uh, protected basins. And um, and there's transient slips too. So yes. like you know this is on the Trent. You know got yes. loopers coming up from the states. Uh, you know you got transient spaces here. Yeah. So we have a, a block of transient slips that uh, that we uh, rent out and. Um, uh, we have visitors from Georgian Bay coming down or up from Simcoe going up to the bay, so a lot of them come come by and stay a night here and maybe a night at the Port of Arroyo. But yeah, so we have the uh, nice transient uh, basin and facilities. This is part of the territories of Chippewas, the Rama First Nation, uh, which I'll admit, I don't know much about, but my man here does, Ben Kuzno, is a researcher. How are you? Good, how are you? Thank you. Good. So you can tell me all about uh, Rama First Nation and some of the history here. So uh, let's just start with her. Someone that knows nothing of it, someone that's on like the Great Loop that shows up and wants to know where are we? And tell me about the history. So uh, we're in Rama First Nation. We've been here for about 200 years. We moved to Rama in about 1848. We've been here ever since. Our, our reserve is pretty unique in that we're surrounded by bigger cities and built up urban areas. Aurelia and the area around it has been traditionally our territory for hundreds of years. So downtown Aurelia, where TD Bank is, Mississauga Street, that was all part of our reserve. So Aurelia basically formed one of the first reserves in Ontario, in Canada, actually. And it was our ancestors who lived there. They lived there from about 1830 to 1836. And then after that, the reserve was allegedly surrendered. And I say allegedly because the reasons why and how it became surrendered are kind of dubious. No one really knows for sure. But essentially what happened was our ancestors were misled and they surrendered the land, allegedly, to the Crown. And from there, it became sold off to settlers who were, by 1836, all over the place here. So from there, our ancestors were kind of stuck. They didn't have any land anymore. They needed a place to go. One place was Chief Island. And it gets that name Chief Island because it was named after Chief Yellowhead, who at the time was our chief and led our people there for a few years until we gradually moved to Rama First Nation. Tell me about that. That's a popular place for boaters, um, but that's part of Rama First Nation, correct? Of course, yeah. Chief Island is part of our reserve. It always has been. Um, it's a really important place to us. So Chief Island, we've, we've called a sacred place for hundreds of years. And the reason why is because we have ancestors buried out there. So there's about 14 graves that are marked, and there's many more unidentified graves out there. But to our people, it's a sacred place. It's a resting place for our ancestors. And of course, now it's possible, very popular with boats as well. And so boats can go and, and, and anchor off because there's the sheltered bay, especially on the, the north side. But you need a mooring permit. There's a, a small fee for that, correct? Exactly, yeah. So in the past couple of years, we've been dealing with boaters who are, I guess, learning the, the way we want them to respect the island and the place around it. So recognizing the area as a cemetery, a burial place, um, it's important that people are respectful. And one way to do that is by getting your mooring permit to ensure that it's not crowded over there, people are within their um, capacity limits and so on. 
We just want to make sure that the island's looked after for a long time, and we don't want anything getting too out of hand over there. The marine permits are actually for the, the bay itself. Um, it is a cemetery, as I've said, so we ask, we ask people to kindly respect that and stay off of the island. Stay on their boat, stay in the bay. By all means, enjoy that area, but the island is sacred to us. And the same reason we wouldn't go to non-Indigenous cemeteries and have parties there, we ask you to do the same thing for ours. If someone's here visiting and wants to learn about, you know, the history or the culture, or ceremonies, things like that, is there anything they can come and check out? Yeah, we do have a heritage centre. People are welcome to visit there anytime. There's usually staff and sometimes with small exhibits set up where people can learn from. And I'd also encourage people to reach out to Rima First Nation directly and ask us for information. We're always happy to share and it's part of that reconciliation journey. Um, I want them to leave knowing that Rama is very proud to be Anishinaabe, very proud to be who and where we are. And that's it. And you can contribute if you're going to come to Lake Kuchiching, you want to go check out the very popular Anchorage Chief Island, make sure you get your mooring permit. You can get it directly through Ojibwe Bay Marina. Don't just go and drop anchor. It is all useful and of course, respect it. It is a sacred site. It is a cemetery as well. So mm -hmm. yeah. thank you, my friend. Thank you. Appreciate it. Fishing. Boom. Nail that segue slash intro. First of all, if you are going to fish, make sure you are not introducing any invasive species. Use locally acquired live bait or plastic lures. Also, make sure you follow all local regulations. For example, here it's illegal to retain any muskie, whether it be from Lake Simcoe or Lake Kuchiching. Fishing in both of these lakes is massively popular. Whether you're after bass, or perch, or northern pike, or any of the dozens of other species in these waters. And there's a rich history dating back thousands of years. In fact, on the west side of the Narrows, which connects Lake Simcoe and Kuchiching, is a national historic site because this is where the First Nations built wooden fishing weirs for generations to trap the fish that were forced between these Narrows. Uh, anyway, yeah, I've repurposed the, uh, the flak jacket back into what it is supposed to be, which is an inflatable fishing PFD. And it's got all these pockets, which you can keep things. I like to keep my fishing license in here. Now, most people who are good anglers would use these for fishing gear and equipment. I use it for snacks. A little chocolate milk in there, hydration's important. We're healthy around here too, so a banana. But did you know that a lot of people consider bananas bad luck when it comes to fishing boats. Now, I have been trying to find out the definitive reason why. Everyone seems to have their own opinion, their own reason for it, and everyone is equally sure that their reason is the right one. Now, they range from it being uh, a way that ships could get infected because spiders or other bugs could be in the banana plants and then they infect the rest of your cargo, right down to it just being bad luck that if you bring bananas with you, it means you're not confident you're gonna catch something to eat and therefore the fishing gods will punish your voyage. You may notice that there is no boat behind us. In fact, there are no boats anywhere on the lake because it is late November and uh, we are pushing the season. And we're gonna be doing some shore fishing, but not with rods and reels. With this, I caved. My son has been watching a lot of magnet fishing videos. That's where you take one of these big magnets with all this rope and you chuck it into the water and slowly drag it in and see what you get. Now, you're gonna want it to have at least 500 pounds of holding power. So if it picks something up, you can drag it through the water. This isn't heavy, obviously, but ugh, it can be difficult to get off. All right, real talk, it's, uh, it's cold, so we're gonna have to bundle up a little bit here. Also, to make sure you get the best possible view, I'm gonna throw the GoPro on the head rack like this. Also, I look super cool and responsible. Wouldn't you buy insurance from me? <laughs> I know I would. Anywho, let's see how this goes. Ah, too high. And if we catch nothing, blame the bananas.
right. Turns out my magnet fishing is just about as good as my fishing fishing. I can 100% see why this is so addictive and growing in popularity on and around the water. Uh, if those rain clouds weren't getting closer, I'd stick this out. And I am 100% taking this on my next couple of boat trips. Just seeing what we can find along the way. But no one seems to have dropped anything around here. Not magnetic, at least. My new, my new fancy mic. <laughs> I like that, buddy. <laughs> I, like I know, that. I gotta get like a proper sticker. I just like tape it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but as long as you don't see the side, it looks like it's. We're living large. Yeah. It's all good. Hey, flip your coin around. Oh, yeah. That a boy. Is that Steve? Yeah, there Check. we go. I can't even say Steve with the blue shirt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nothing we can do at this point. We'll put it this in your protection. This is not a Zen moment. <laughs> and taunt the yoga people. The summer, the summer, the summer of you.